Hello and welcome back to the channel. Thanks ever so much for joining me in another of my interview series, becoming very popular, I'm pleased to see. Today, very excited to be talking to a nurse and currently a, or also I should say, a restorative health coach who's worked in as a nurse for 33 years in the uh, NHS and has seen a whole load of interesting things on the vaccine side, before the vaccine that we've all been talking about in recent times, but of course, earlier vaccines, which have had uh, an interesting history. We will remember the uh, interesting, shall I say interesting, I'm using that too many times, but the MMR vaccine had a lot of issues at one point, and um, there was a sort of confusion about whether it was safe or not safe and it seems to be that it is safe at least that's the official story and that's what we go with so let's talk to russ hello russ hi richard how are you doing uh thank you very much for, for joining me very kind of you to come in i sort of glossed over a little bit about what you do there because um i'm not a nurse but you are a nurse and you've been in the in the industry now i, I call it an industry um, is, is it a vocation still or is it still just an industry for yeah for me it's a vocation that's why i still continue to care despite the fact it may not be in a specific nursing role but restorative health coaching and basically yes it's i think it's definitely a vocation if we can't do it we get unwell yes and it's it's people like you you are the people the nurses are the people that the patients like me when i'm in there are mostly interacting with oh absolutely yeah cold uh, face yeah, and so you, you see the doctors, and, and you don't even know if they are doctors these days. Whenever I've been there, you're not quite That's sure. They're so young, I know. Uh, and, <laughs> That's because we're old. But, but you sort of know who the nurses are, and, and you're the ones that you talk to. And, and so I guess nurses have got to be... They've got to have not necessarily the, the you know the full knowledge a doctor has in the nth, in, in the nuance of every piece of stuff, but you've got to have such a broad... Um, understanding of medicine overall because you're getting specialities from all sorts of places and then you're having to deliver that or administer it absolutely so basically the nurse is the queen pin usually because the feminine but in my sense king pin all the information coming in and with the last bastion of accountability to the patient to make sure what we've been told to do is in actually the, the best interest of the patient and if we disagree we are to go withhold no you need to sort it out because of x y and z right oh i didn't that's realize that job. so so yes yeah, so you if you think that the patient this particular process that you're going to deliver or administer whatever the technical term is is well, not right you can turn around and say hang on a minute i think maybe we need to reevaluate this and i've had to do that many times i used to work in cardiac intensive care at gosh king's high dependency unit cardiac high dependency unit post cabbage cardiac artery, by, cardiac artery bypass graft surgery sorry back in the day when we did them a lot and simply uh yeah i've had to do that many times with uh overzealous doctors turning off adrenaline pumps instead of weaning them etc yes so yeah. you, you you create that uh, relationship with the patient that's also crucial, especially from the patient's point of view, um, in terms of trust <laughs> and, and all of that, but also from your point of view to get to know what is actually going to be beneficial for them. And so working in, in my areas, which was a, a joy, because you only had one or two patients a day. Right. That's good. So you can yeah. really get to know your man or your woman, right? So I'm chatty, right? So I just chat to anybody. And I'm anything that's on for 12 and a half hours. So you've got to get on, really. Yes. So if you get that close to people doing all their ablutions, etc., and if you can chat, then you find out a great deal about them, more than their history, and then you can find out how that's relevant to what's going on for them now and any addendums to the notes you need to make or anything of interest to the, that might be of interest medically to the docs. Right. Yeah, no, so that's really that's really nice to sort of get that broad understanding of what what nurses do um, on an ordinary scale on an ordinary um, situation. Now, of course, we've gone through an extraordinary period um, where the government has sort of made a decision that uh, during the pandemic, of course, that um, a certain vaccine has come on the market it's an experimental vaccine and it's been um, administered to people um, and not necessarily 
what's the word you, you know normally you have to have uh, consent don't you you have to oh. you have to know you have to a give consent and b you have to know what all the side effects are and, and all of those sort of things and to then be able to give informed consent informed, informed consent, consent is all the information known of the substance you're about to imbibe in this case is given yes in a and, way that, again, nurses, our job is to take the information from the doctor and the medicine and make it and write it into understandable information to the patient we are dealing with at the time. Right. In a sense. So if you're yeah. talking to someone who's Indian or whatever, translator, and if you're talking to somebody who drives buses, then you make it like really simple. But if you're talking to someone else, you can be a bit more polluting. That makes sense? Yeah. Depending uh, on your own range. So, yes. You know, what do I need? But the answer to the question is always, is it going to kill me? Well, yeah. Yeah, okay. And then is it going to make me ill? Well, okay. And in this case of that particular, which we're speaking of, we know that anecdotally, after the swine flu vax, many people got ill, got flu, when they had the swine flu vax. Oh, well, that's just it working through you. Yeah, but they got flu. If they mm. didn't take the vax, they didn't get a flu. I don't have the vax, I don't get flus. People who get vax get more flus. These are the anecdotals we seem to see. And mm. I focus specifically um, in my career in the community looking after the, 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 um, those patients in community that being vaccine injured. And usually when you have autism, ADD, epilepsy, et cetera, in community, and you talk to the mums who are the knowledge of their children, they are, uh, without equivocation for me, in my experience, every single parent with a ADD, ADHD, a twistic, epileptic patient, child, history of vaccine. Normal markers, red book, in, you know, going to the practice nurse and midwife after born, red book, and get it all signed off, vaccine, and then neurodivergency. So it's the hidden cost that's not totally spoken about i've got the own history that my, my own family i don't know if i shared in my letter maybe but you've got a hidden cost which actually is a lot of kids now right we actually cater for it at school you know look at johnny you know special needs etc because they're more prolific than they've ever been before yes regardless of what they tell you in history so the conversation of pro-choice is informed consent. That's just yes. medical law. Yes, so you can tell, so somebody coming in, particularly, as you said, if you go back before the, the vaccine that we're all talking about currently oh. and the problems that, it, it, you know, in the past, everyone sort of said, well, vaccines are safe, aren't they? They're 100% safe. And they may well be for that person, but it's the choice that that person who is about to have it, or their children, if they're the guardian, have got to make, and they need the informed consent so they can make that choice based on all the knowledge that right. is said. But And the knowledge attained. So if we talk about the polio vaccine. Yes. Right? Yeah. Great vaccine. Works really well. Very little side effects that we know of per 100,000 people. Anything less than one, we're good. Right? That's a good vaccine. Yeah. Polio. We can go back to uh, some of the older ones. We've got the history of giving two, three, four decades, five decades of giving it. So we know it's safe. It's got a yes. great safety record, right? The ones we have today wouldn't even pass that same safety record to make sure that the others are valid. And again, Dr. John Campbell, I spoke of him before. And YouTube, who's, who's on, on YouTube. On, yeah, Check on him YouTube. Out. He's, he's spoken about this specifically on his episodes that these wouldn't even get through, wouldn't even get through um, ethics. So why are these even out? Because they wouldn't get through ethics based on their performance of how many people are affected per 100,000. So there's, a, so there's a, a real question then from, from a nurse's point of view would be, why are we giving people a, an experimental vaccine or have been, and um, it, we've, we've stopped here, but in other parts of the world, they're still applying this stuff uh, why why would we give it um and how do you give that informed consent because it seems to me that a lot of people were giving it there was no informed consent it was pretty much you're having it 
whether you like it or not. And in some right. cases, in, certainly in the nursing profession and in care homes, oh. if you don't, you don't have a job. Right. And that, I mean, if you're not co-opting the profession by that, I don't know what you're doing. Hmm. You know, it's either take it or it's the, or it's the chop. Well, that's not even an option. <laughs> you know, you can't even get another job. Because I'm going to leave this nursing home because I've got have the vaccine. Well, it's a na- it was a national thing, right? That yes. was the thing. And it was Dr. Steve James from King's College ITU. King's ITU? Could yeah. be. And uh, taking on Savage Javi back last January. Was he the guy saying, who was on the television that, he, we, was that he caught? Yeah, absolutely. Right? I remember the clip. Love the anaesthetists. They're wicked. So <laughs> it's a case of anaesthetists are just amazing. Uh, that they're the guys I used to work alongside in my environments, like with all the whole teams, right? So it's right. good. So, um, and he just laid it out, you know, vaccine. So 10 weeks, immunity. Then what? You're going to knock them, every, knock them up every month? Excuse the expression. Going to give them another jab every month to maintain that level of... No, you're not going to do that. And then if you've had COVID, then your natural immunity is, look, I've got, he, I've, he said, I've been working COVID two years, I've had COVID two or three times, and I've got the equipment to go, have I got pathogens for COVID? Yes, you do. I've got antibodies, yay! I'm COVID free. What's your problem with the vaccine? What's this push? Yeah. If you've been ill, you get the antibodies, so you're not ill again, because it didn't kill you. That's na- nature at work. So, d- so this whole jab, 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 and the child vaccines, etc., which America suffers from massively, and of course we are pushed here, is like, are we? That's we don't know enough. <laughs> so, so roll forward to where we are today, and we've oh. seen we've seen the excess deaths suddenly appearing in the ONS figures. Yeah, and uh, I think they've stopped publishing. Uh, some of these since May last year, um, although I think they are the figures are still being collected. It's just that we don't know quite what they are. But we've <laughs> seen we for reasons that uh, couldn't possibly comment on. Why, would, us all. why? Why would they not publish them when they have? But we know that these excess deaths are there. The figures are out um, up until May, and more figures are being collected by other. Um, data people but we've also had so much anecdotal evidence left right and center that something's going on uh, and not just in this country of course around the world and and everywhere you go is everyone's talking about it apart from the government who are completely ignoring it even after Andrew Bridgen stood up and said I'm slightly worried about this. Well, I'm very worried about this because of the excess deaths, the the number of people who have also reported harms up at that point, just under half a million on the yellow card system, which generally only 10% of people even bother to do. So the, the harms must be much higher than that. And ordinarily, we would have stopped any medical procedure that had that sort of level of harm. But it's not just this country, it's all around the world and everywhere. And, and so the other people who aren't talking about, of course, is the journalist on mainstream media who you would think with such a huge tragedy going around or a big question would be on it like nobody's business. But they also have the sellotape over the mouth. Now, as a nurse... You know, you're not necessarily watching mainstream media all day long and not necessarily just believing whatever comes out of the government. You're seeing all of this, if not firsthand, certainly anecdotally and amongst your colleagues. How does this make you feel? What are you thinking? So it's really difficult when you're doing 60-hour weeks because you've got to do four and a half, whatever, five days a week because you, you don't get paid much, right? So you did bank. Mm. The ex- so it's very difficult then to be able to live your life and filter all this other stuff even if people are saying it to you, because right. you're too busy doing it. Yeah. And I'll be really clear. The amount of nurses that actually give vaccines are like, like, I've never given a vaccine in my life. In my 30-year career, I've given a lot of other stuff, saved a lot of lives, but never a vaccine. And I can refuse to give a vaccine should someone say, Russ, would you give this vaccine? I can say, no. And they can say, why not? And I can go, well, because I don't believe in that. So I'm not going to be part of that, right? Right. So, so you can't, you can't be forced. Something. Yeah. Oh, okay. That's, that's interesting. Well, 
So you can be extremely pressured by your manager. Right. <laughs> and that's yeah. what the reporting system should be for, okay? But um, certainly if you are seeing things that are not, you're just like, no, okay? You stop, you report. If not, go shoot. The point is you should go shoot your manager, then your manager's manager, then management. Nah, nah, nah. But I don't have a manager. So I, I contacted GMC, General Medical Council, the Nursing Group Council, Royal College of Nursing, Rishi Sunak and Prime Minister, and asked them directly, I'm going to paraphrase, mm. WTF, and these are the questions, and these are the, this is the information, and if, why isn't there public outcry, and why, aren't we ma- why isn't this a major, major point of concern for all of your agencies? Yes. And bearing in mind that we, I am responsible to the NMC to maintain their very high standards of nursing care if I'm to meet their code of conduct. And they are simply there for me to, to suspend, dismiss or sanction me should I fail to um, maintain those standards in the public's eyes based on complaint and investigation. What I am saying to them is, do you meet the standards of your members by co- being co-opted into something which is not in the public interest, not your members' interest, have you spent any independent due diligence time to, to actually assess the information independently of other influence before you started shoving it down our throats? Mm. In a nutshell. And I got a letter back from the GMC. <laughs> right, oh, okay. I'm waiting for the others. I said it first of February. I gave him twenty eight days. I thought I'd be generous. Yeah. Right? And um I won't bore you, but basically it says, Thank you very much for your kind letter. Because you're not a doctor, it's not our remit is what it's written. To discuss not a, these it's right. not our remit to discuss these things with you. Which is That's a bit of insulting, isn't it? A bit rude to be honest. <laughs> it's not even a, oh we are aware. Yeah, uh, but and we are doing um, and just to reassure you, Mr. Mayor, you know, <laughs> just to make it clear, no, uh, we looked at your letter, and um, we don't need to answer it. So they oh. expect you to stick to a a very high standard. So this is the GMC, right? The General Mayor Council. Yeah. But should I receive a similar one, which I expect to? From the NMC, the Nursing Midwifery Council, which is my governing body, yes. then the conversation is one of, that's just rude. Right. <laughs> and if you're not meeting the standards that I meet to be a member of you, then do you meet my standards for me to remain a member? Right, okay. So, but Do if I you... reflect you and do you reflect me any longer? Where does and that, that leave? basically require me to abdicate? Yes, I was going to say, where does that leave you? So you, you yeah. have then have to ab- abdicate, and which I'd is be happy a... to do so. <laughs> right, but uh, and I suppose if all nurses took that um, approach, they wouldn't have any nurses. If, if all nurses took that approach, and basically went through the RCN and said, "Look, because the Royal College of Nursing is our union." Hmm. If all nurses on mass were saying, you know what? Yeah, well, no. This is our job on the line, our livelihood, our vocation. And we're doing what? And we're expected to take literally what? And we do more with less? And consistently be chopped and chopped and chopped? And ignored when we go on strike? So why? And our own agency this is gmc again i'm talking about Mm. our own agency of employment and professionality hasn't even got our backs it's just pushing this stuff and it's not asking not answering the questions that many of us are answering aren't asking even if we can't ask them overtly across the shop floor the ward floor the unit floor but having a coffee Mm. with a close mate going is it just us? Because everyone else seems to be playing along, and I don't know. If, I don't know if I'm on the odd one out, but I've never known that, so that's probably normal for me. <laughs> but do you know what I mean? It's like yes. many of us now, through the media of the media we have, 
we can now have these conversations more openly. Dr. John Campbell again, what he wrote yesterday about the WHO Health Organization refusing to investigate the allegations of, of a Wuhan leak and refusing to do any investigation on any level, in his words, is a disgrace. So just, just reiterate that, if you wouldn't mind. The World Health Authority have stated yeah. that they will not investigate any any in any way regarding the cause or the source of the COVID-19 virus, which is reneging on a promise they made previously. Right. And there'll be no investigation whatsoever. And what about, did they mention anything about the vaccine? Are they, so does I that, think that's I included... wouldn't like to do any disservice to the wonderful oration that Dr. John Campbell did yesterday. Yes. So I recommend whoever wants to can go and look at it. Because Dr. John, three years ago, he was a nurse. He's a nurse, his PhD in statistics, I believe. Amazing. Three years ago, started tracking the COVID and was pro vax and pro COVID and pro medicine because he's a nurse and he's a solid man, solid soldier, doing his thing, looking at the research coming through the pharmaceutical companies, he now realizes. And then, as it was like getting away from us, and then where we are now, he's just like, uh, why eyes wide open, going holy moly. Yeah. So if anybody, I mean, people who have watched his channel will see that he's gone through a hundred and eighty degree um, situation. Oh. Yeah, oh. where he was, and I remember coming across him um, right at the start and thinking, "Oh, this is interesting." And, and I had my own reservations, which um, you know, and I've spoken about those. And I thought, oh, my God, he's pushing he's pushing something I disagree with. So I kind of lost a bit of interest. And then when I discovered, oh, actually, hang on a minute. He is he's had a he's through the science and wherever it leads, as his banners say, oh. you know, he, he has not just doubled down and said, oh, well, you know, it's still OK and, and, and peddled. He's actually, you know, put his head on the on the parapet but reported the science, and it's, and it's very impressive to see that. He does it so wonderfully, doesn't he? He's, not, he doesn't throw any, he's throwing cake without cake. And, it's and really his, interesting. <laughs> what, what if, I, I, a slight digression here, but one of my favourite moments is when he constantly would refer to the YouTube guidelines, and on one particular occasion he said, oh, let's just have another look at the guidelines. Here they are. I've put them in uh, a different font here. They're in Comic Sans. And you just, you know, you don't need to be <laughs> clever. And then it was just, and he just left it hanging. You knew what he meant. And I, I just genius. love that witticism. Um, so you can see that his level of trust in the situation has very much changed. How has trust now do you feel the general public are trusting the medical profession and nurses? Because from, from where I am, I'm struggling to see the trust or, or to have the trust. So, full disclosure, I haven't done a clinical shift for three years. That's because I'm just like, I'm done. Yeah. <laughs> for reasons you've explained, I suppose. Well, yeah. and also, you know, it's hard slog. You know, yeah. I'm 50. I was 49 when I left, started at 17, and it's a hard slot, yeah. right? And uh, done most things in the profession at, at very good level, senior education, senior instructor, you know, a resuscitation specialist, and that's what I did for a living, hence I did it with the whole team, we were amazing, because most play by intensive care units are amazing, et cetera, et cetera. So pretty mm. much been around the block. And... Um, I mean, if we just talk about, we could just talk about me medication, just mm. the whole conversation of medication by itself is a, you know, how long you got. But at the end of the day, we're only putting a band-aid on the problem and suppressing the symptoms. We're never dealing with the cause. Mm. And so I was on the journey of gut health and microbiome probiotics 20 years ago. So um, and Hippoc as Hippocrates states, all, med all disease starts and ends in the gut. Hence, let food be the medicine, and medicine be thy food. Right. So we have many cures for many things. We just don't share it with the public because there's no money in it. It's called right. food. Yes. <laughs> I, I, and if you I, well, grow your food the, in the, the right I, soil, then you get the right food, 
because uh, it's just about soil quality and food nutrition mm. and avoiding lectins, oxalates and phytates, whole conversation, but basically foods that make you ill, which is grain, wheat, nuts, for the majority of people, get them off those, remove any FODMAPs, that's all sugars, and then just get them back to repairing their guts and basically create, en encouraging mitochondrial uncoupling. And I don't recommend anybody to read Dr. Gundry unlocking the Kyoto Code. His plant paradox and longevity paradox. Unlocking that, what is um, that? Unlocking the keto code. Unlocking. The, how do you spell keto? K E T O. <laughs> so easy. <isn't> it? <laughs> I know, like that, right? Okay, and then uh, um, plant paradox, the plant paradox, and the longevity paradox. Is that the same book or two different books? Uh, th uh, three different books. Actually. Oh right, okay. Yeah, right, absolutely. Right. And he's just got it down. I just have so respect. He's on YouTube. You can't move. Forgot to learn. He's the old guy looking like a young Santa. Right. He looks okay. amazing. He's 72, bless him, or whatever oh, okay. he is now. It looks See, incredible. It's interesting yeah. you say that about nuts, because often you hear, you know, if you're if you're going on a not so meaty diet, you, you know, you right. eat a lot of nuts and stuff. And, and some people have nut re allergies and bits and pieces. Um, Good news. Just knock on the head, peanuts and the cashews and just soak the others before you eat them. In water. In water, yeah, twenty four yeah. hours, and I just take them. As opposed to, food, as opposed right? to say whiskey, or, as opposed... <laughs> or, just, you know, or cider, or something like that. You know. But you know, the conversation for me of consistently working within a vacation of my choice, which is caring. Hence, I became a nurse. Yes, and then consistently studying for the lot since for the last thirty three years. Not just nursing, but using that money to then go deeper into what is... So we're not actually curing anything. We're just doing surgery, taking it out, mm. doing radiotherapy, or giving medication. And quite frankly, the evidence is quite clear. None of that's actually working for the long-term health of the patient at all. No. no. So loads of other places that manage... And still, uh, humanity is still here after how many thousand years... So we must have been doing something right, because if these guys remain in, in charge, we're all going to be dead in 100 years anyway, because yeah. of the food we're eating. And we are what our food ate. So uh, no, if your food's I... eating grains, etc., then you, you're just eating all these lectins, spites, blah, blah, blah. Dr. Gundry has it down. But you can contact me as well. It's all fine. <laughs> but the conversation is, um, you know, we were doing very well pre-World War II. Yes. Uh, no, absolutely. I mean, the the whole industry for me, um, farming is so key to everything. And we've taken the food industry and then the pharmaceutical industry and they oh. seem to have decided. They created that, a mutant baby. <laughs> yeah. And, and they're keeping us ill by uh, and therefore keeping us on medications and, and, and just keeping the the um, the symptoms, not the cure. Not the causes, well, rather. Whereas, as as if you eat, you know, good healthy food, you're you're not going to um, suffer. And of course, it's very difficult to do that in this world at the moment. With, you know, as as I forget who it was, somebody said, if you go to a supermarket, you don't really need to go much more than twenty feet into the supermarket because that's where the fresh food, fruit is. The rest of it is processed rubbish. Leave it. And unfortunately, a lot of our fruit is not digestible by us, what we call fat apes. Okay? <laughs> We're the only fat ape. Some of us aren't, some of us yeah. are, but when we are, we are a proper fat ape, right? Yeah. And even if you have lots of fruit, that puts on the weight because they're full of FODMAPs and lectins and oxalates and phytates that what's cause it, all the what's inflammation. A, what's a FODMAP? So a FODMAP is a fermented oligosaccharide, sugar, Disaccharide, sugar, monosaccharide, sugar, and polyol, sugar. <laughs> and how does, that, xylitol. how does that get into the fruit? Well, it is fruit. Is it, is it, so, oh, that's, is fruit that, so, oh, I see. Yeah. So that's a natural thing. That's, that's, that's not... a natural thing. <laughs> right, okay. okay. <laughs> Berries just... come around and inject it. <laughs> <laughs> what I was trying to get to is it wasn't a malicious thing or, or it's, not no, a, it's, just it's not a natural. toxin that's put in by man. It's right, a natural thing. This... So this is the key. Yeah. Food, fr plants don't exist for us to eat them. They, they don't. exist. They exist to thrive. You exist to thrive. Yes. You don't exist for me to eat you. No. You exist hopefully. to thrive. 
Yes. For the next generation, the proliferation of the voves. And the same for the Mars, right? And the mm. same for all plants. So for about however many million years before insects came along, it was a very beautiful, you know, Garden of Eden plant paradise. They had it all to themselves. And then insects came along and suddenly they had to create chemical warfare to detract things from eating it or its babies. And these things, we know about poisons and dead nightshade and all these bits and pieces and thorns. They're very obvious. But the things in the plants are called lectins, right. phytates, and oxalates. So lectins, uh, so glucose, one of the first things absorbed by the body as energy in the stomach when you eat food. So you've got immediate energy. Then it goes, permeates through the capillary walls and the walls, therefore, of the cells that it will give energy to. Right. Yeah. And it does that in the presence of insulin, the hormone. Mm. Lectins bind, if you like, like barnacles to that glucose cell or orb, impeding its ability to permeate through the capillary and cell walls. So you have to punch up your insulin to force it through. Right. And that's how you get prediabetes and diabetes. So it's not just about I don't have much sugar. It's also about for how many lectins you're having in the bits of sugar you got. That makes right, sense. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and and you're. It's interesting then that we, prior to say the 20th century, were able yeah. to sort of work that out uh -huh. w w without having to study any science or anything. We just no. Did we just it. ate from the land. It was all organic, right? Yeah. And <laughs> and and here we are thinking that we're incredibly clever and civilized, and sophisticated. Very by, yeah, very sophisticated. And we're just poisoning each other. We're just killing ourselves, left, right, yeah. centre. Absolutely. And getting ill. Um, so phytates uh, stop minerals from being absorbed. And oxalates, basically, um, my mind's eye, people like uh, crystallizations in the cells. So they, they, um, they accumulate in soft tissue areas. So the female genital parts can be very painful, fibromyalgia, endometriosis, this type of thing, arthritis, inflammatory diseases with pain, oxalates. So we're talking about br uh, grains, beans, legumes, lots of fruits, and then not so about not having them, yeah. pairing them properly with cooking. Cooking is fantastic, right? We're the only species on the planet that does it, and we're yeah. very good. If we do it appropriately, then we can nullify a lot of these things and still enjoy our favourite food. I was going to say, if you take out fruits, legumes, um, what was the other, nuts, if you take out you're all just those a, things... You're just a meat eater. That's what you are. <laughs> I, well, I, I was going to say, what else have you got left? You know, cabbage. Yeah, just humans. Yeah, cabbage and human, yes, <laughs> flesh eating zombie. <laughs> right. So then, so so uh, so we've we've transgressed this conversation, which I hope, much, hope the true. audience don't mind. But um, so yeah, so coming back to health, then and ordinary health. I mean, if just trying to eat a balanced diet is actually f f in this day and age with all the choices we've got and and a lot of people thinking oh crikey hang on nuts i can't do and wheat i better not have and this that, and the other i don't know if we're not even doing that but we're actually having all just this processed stuff that we've allowed we've farmed out if i can use that term uh, the, the 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 preparation of food to large industrial companies so that it comes on a piece of polystyrene or styrofoam for the americans right um and in a box with lots of nice colors and prints and claims that there's these nutrients and these nutrients and you just shove it into the microwave and away you go because it's instant ping food what are we doing to our health right i think the more important question that i've been asking myself my entire career is what's the solution right okay we know that everyone's talking about the problem we all know the problem right mm. some of us know the problem problem more than others some more in depth and more specialized, but basically there's a general knowing of what the problem is, right? So for me, it's all about, and nothing grows without having soil. Yeah. And good soil, because of the um, spraying, fungiciding, herbiciding, you know, killing pretty much everything, then uh, you have sterilized the soil and you've also poisoned the soil. Mm. So, I have a community garden and also I'm setting up a community garden in my backspace, which I'm happy to do with stuff in the future. I'm and creating a soil cat. and creating a soil farm. Why do you want a soil farm? Well you want micronutrient rich soil. 
because in micronutrient rich soil that you've actually grown and compost free it's just right so you basically just get loads of stuff you'd otherwise throw away and put it together and create compost it's really right. easy yeah and it's and free it, and it's what people did it's what people did right yeah so uh, it, for me yeah go on. no no i was just gonna say it's what i mean i um I spent uh, quite a long time reading up on old farming books and on the, the old agriculture, you know, mixed farms, small farms in which they would gather the manure from all sorts of things and they would use sheep and geese and chickens and hens oh, and right. pigs and, and all of that. And so you would have, there's a book, I forget his name now, George somebody or other called The Farming Ladder and it's uh, it's a 1930s book and it kept getting... Uh, it was ne it was not out of print for a long, long time till the Second World War, and it was it was sort of passed around as the authority on how to be a successful farmer. In and the basics of it was that you have everything you need. You very rarely needed to go elsewhere oh. because because you would grow food for your animals and your animals would provide the fertilizer which would go yeah. on the land for the crops that you ultimately eat yourself and pass on. And when the question is asked, what did your lamb eat or your pig or hen eat? The answer is, I don't know, whatever's growing. Yeah. <laughs> it's not like grain or whatever, because you are what your, your food ate. So, yes, yeah, so micronutrient rich soil. And if you mix that with biochar, so charcoal, and uh, douse it really quickly, then it makes a, the charcoal goes pop. And when you, when you drop it, it should clinkle like glass. That's All how right. good the charcoal should be, yeah. right? So then you've got your micronutrient-rich soil. So horses are great. So if you've mm. got, we've got horses on the back of our land, which are very lucky to have that. So they create poo, manure, and we pile that as poo picking from the field. Then, But the manure, to the best of my knowledge, is one of the very good substances that attracts the, the red-purple worms. Good worms. You put good worms, and they eat it, and their castings, their poop, is the lovely rich fresh soil that we're looking for right that's now micronutrient rich because it's the gut mi microbiome of the purple of those particular worms their gut microbiome that is the foundation bacteria for everything else in the substrate yeah so you've got that and yeah. you can get food 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 castings and straw and paper and cardboard and turn it over loads of times Really great soil, inoculate it with the biochar, put it on your bed, 70% less watering per year. Only makes the beds better and more compost. And the plants you get are Jurassic and unbelievable. And then you make sure you don't plant plants that you're having a problem with. Mm. So don't plant tomatoes, don't plant peas, they're full of lectins. And just be aware of other things you are going to eat more of as part of your self healing. Just let food be their medicine, and medicine be their food, and then network with community, which is what I do, to basically for my other stuff. So whether I get my grass-fed, grass-finished meats, I go to Sussex at the moment. I live in Essex. So um, you come to Sussex. And, I'm in Sussex. Right. So uh, Plorhatch Farm. Which farm? In Plorhatch, in um, gosh, Forest Road. And oh, you've got okay. Tablehurst yeah. there, you've got Middle yeah. Farm. Yeah, yeah. So the grass fed, grass finished, heart, liver, and kidneys, two pounds, three pounds, four pounds cheap. It's the best parts of the meat, best parts of the animal. Right? Really good for the gut. And then you just carry on with mitochondrial and coupling through the Gundry method. So this this whole ecology that you've just described that is mm. the solution to our uh, to our health problems and to it's so... the solution to our health problems. And if ten percent of the population does the micronutrient rich biochar because it's charcoal, so if you have an over overdose at, w at work, <laughs> where I used to work, if mm. someone came in with an overdose, right, we give them to guzzle charcoal because it absorbs all the toxins, so you flush it out. That's what charcoal does; it absorbs stuff. Okay, carbon. So you've laid it on 10% of the planet, then it draws in all the methane and carbon dioxide so you don't have a global gas problem anymore, right? Right. So it may not be the solution to humanity, but it's a good solution to get good food in you and make sure you're rewilding the environment in which you live. Because if you've got the right bacteria at the very bottom of the bacterial food chain, which is the castings of the red worms, to the best of my knowledge, yeah. then everything else can exist. 
and you're just facilitating it. And wildflowers, all sorts of things can be created and given. Yeah. And so the only thing then wrong with all of that is that you have the food industry, you have big pharma and the health industry all hell bent on making sure that doesn't happen because they wouldn't exist. In in well, the size to... in the size Sorry, forgive me. Well, you yeah, know, Karen. So basically so yeah, so I create home eds and also do mentoring. We're actually building at the moment. That's what we've done it somewhere else. We're building a bigger one at the moment. Um, as a community space to teach people. Mm. Uh, we're calling it I'm opening for CIC called Being Community, a community interest charity called Being Community as part of the we're in just wherever which way you wish to look at it. As far as I'm concerned, we're in completely fresh waters. We can no longer rely on the, the service of care that was available to us 20 years ago, like mm. it or not, from ambulance to availability of nurses to availability of specialists to availability of service. Mm. So with this do less with more attitude it's just you know we just we're just losing staff hand over fist and replacing them with no disrespect to them but with other other nation staff who don't speak the language as mm. well and don't have the same training and don't have the same maybe understanding that indigenous nurses do yeah i appreciate it's a white british male born in london father irish mother yarmouth then i was like a unicorn probably a bad, bad metaphor but you know I stuck out like a sore thumb because right. I was white I was English and then I was male but when so, everyone else is Portuguese Filipino yes in the so, NHS workforce so in a way you're, what you're saying is and I've been sort of hinting at this in some of my other videos is that we we are to, to borrow a phrase from Brexit we need to take back control for ourselves oh. and have more responsibility for ourselves. Take more responsibility for ourselves. For Absolutely. ourselves, yeah. And and help one another to to go down that path, which will take time, oh. but by osmosis, it will reduce the need for these big firms and they will just wither and die as we, the people, taking that responsibility like we once used to do. As you say, you know, we don't need to rely on these big care organisations. And I mean, I tell the story of a, a woman who looked after my dad for a while and she would spend every morning with about 15 pills or, or had a load of pills and it would take a half an hour to have these pills. And she was always moaning about these damn pills. And my sister, who's a nurse, was uh, there at the time and she was just moaning and moaning about these pills and, and she was overweight and had you know various problems hence the pills um, but she she never did anything for herself and she ate cardboard food and all the all of that and this woman was moaning about these pills and in the end my sister said what would happen if you don't have the pills and she said well I, I don't know I imagine I'll die I said well I don't know what you're moaning about then <laughs> <laughs> um but it, but because that doesn't really illustrate the story I really mean is that actually if she was to not have the pills or if she looked after herself, she wouldn't be in that situation in the first place, oh. most likely. Oh, absolutely. Um, and, you know, as I say, I keep referring to Dr. Gundry because he's an excellent reference. Um, but, you know, curative of those things that affect you physically and certainly when you do the gut health, mm. uh, uh, Dr. Campbell. Dr. Natasha Cam McBride with fantastic work, curative ADD, ADHD, um, epilepsy, bipolar, schizophrenia, depression. And that book is 25, 30 years old now. You know, it's not new knowledge. I will look for them and put them in the description. Um, <laughs> to take this, just before we finish, to take this back to the vaccine problems and the oh. excess deaths, just to take that back, people who are suffering from the complications, shall we say, and the harms, clearly their health going forward now it, and looking after their health is, is even is more priority. important. Is, is absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. Which is why I'm giving you the references so you can find that for yourself. You can yeah. contact me. I don't, I'll put a, I don't know, I'll give it to Richard, whatever. Yeah, I can put a link um, but this is the, because, the, so the conversation, you go to the shops and you pick your organic, right, whatever, if you mm. can afford right? Or you go to your market, got market farm or garden, wherever, you pick it up, okay? You've no idea what that's been sprayed with. No. How old the soil is. Even, whether it's even if it's organic. GM. You've got no, you've got nothing. No. 
It's, and also, many foods have a birth date, which is a whole different conversation. But basically, I advocate, as does Gundry, to eat as if it were 10,000 years ago. Because the first rice was the 4,000, 6,000, the first grain was 9,000. So if you're eating 10,000 years ago, then you're eating as God, Jehovah, Creator, all it is provided for you, mm. right? And that's how you're designed. So the, gut in, the, the microbiome in your gut must be a reflection of the microbiome in your soil, which you're getting your food from, mm. right? So if you get that right, you can improve your immunity significantly, and you will. Okay, mm. especially when we're talking about vitamin D and all these other supplements, which you can't get because we're no longer nomadically walking outside. Mm. And the reason why I proliferate such an outdoor focused concept, such as a soil farm, food security garden, and others, and we have a few spots around Essex and we're doing really good stuff, is because there's nothing better. You go to any doctor of any description, say, How can I look at a mental health doc? And he'll say, Go and do some gardening. Get your hands in the soil, mm. be with some other people, which is usually in silence because you're gardening, mm. and go get some sun and some weather, <laughs> a bit of wind, a bit of rain, a bit of sand, a bit out there, put your hands in the soil, walk on the bare earth, and you will feel better. Fantastic. Russ, it's been an absolute joy to talk to you, and we've gone in full circle in a way. Uh, and we've also offered a cure as well as had a moan right. about what's gone on. And that's that's just brilliant. So, as I say, I'll put the links to the books in the description. I'll put a link to you in the description. I'll, um, I think it might be in your email, actually, that you originally sent. But I'll Yeah, uh, it's changing you... a bit. But it's OK. You can still contact me. It's an evolving oh. process. So bear oh, okay. with me. <laughs> um, but it's been a wonderful conversation. I hope people got something out of it. Do leave your uh, comments in the comments boxes below. Um, but thank you so much, Russ. That's been really, really fascinating. Thank really you, Richard. It. Thank you, viewers. God bless. Have a wonderful rest of your day. So I'll be back again with uh, more interviews. I have got, interestingly, I am going to be talking to Sir Julian Rose, who uh, is uh, an authority on organic farming, apparently, um, very soon. And I believe he, for, I don't know whether it's for his sins or for his pleasure, he taught the king about organic farming. So I'll be talking to him in a day or so, I think. So something to look forward to. But in the meantime, thank you so much again, Russ. And I'll talk to all my viewers very soon.